When anointing your home, pray aloud in every room. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill every square inch of your home. Pray that only His will will be done and that everything that is said and done in your home will be pleasing unto the Lord. This is a way of consecrating and dedicating your home to Him. Rebuke the powers of darkness and any attempt of the enemy against your home or your family. Plead the blood of Jesus over each and every room and your family. There is great power in the blood of the Lamb. As you do these things, place oil on the frame of every doorway and windowsill in your home. Do this by faith, believing and receiving God's supernatural protection over your home and family. How to make anointing oil and pray over your home. I like to use olive oil because it's used in the Bible, but you use any oil that you want and make sure that you separate it out. Once you do that, pray over it like this. God, I know all power comes from you and I ask that you would bless this anointing oil as I separate it out as holy for your service, God. Use it as I pray over myself, my family, my home, and others in Jesus' mighty name. Now walk through your home and anoint it with oil. Father, I thank you, God, that you are touching and blessing this place. I plead the blood of Jesus. I thank you for your protection. I command all demonic forces to leave out of here now. And I loose the Holy Spirit to be in this home in Jesus' name. You can anoint your doors, your beds, your kids, whatever you would like in your home. Get some oil. Então vamos pegar óleo. And you're going to go all around your house on the inside. Step two. Passo número dois. In the name of Jesus, no nome de Jesus, I take authority eu tomo autoridade over every evil spirit in this place. Para. I command you spirits, eu, and I don't say demons, because if there's any human spirits in there, I want them out too. Get out this door saiam dessa porta right now já, in Jesus' name. No nome de Jesus. And don't you touch anything on your way. Aí. I always say, get off our property. Eu sempre digo, sai da nossa propriedade. Right now and forever. Já e para sempre. In Jesus name. No nome de Jesus. And don't you touch anything on your way, especially none of our animals. Yes. In Jesus name. No nome de Jesus. Then you anoint the last door. Última porta. And you pray. E você ora. And you say, Father. E diz, Pai. In the name of Jesus. No nome de Jesus. I ask you to cleanse and seal my home. And I thank you for it in Jesus. So Kathy, I thought I thought he was going to say, pour a little bit in the bottle. And he said, but these people, he said, these people are weapons. These people would not be the people that just pray a little bit. These people will point their weapon. These people will tell the devil. If you don't shut up, I'm going to get my weapon. Because the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down. Anoint your home with oil. Praying over the oil is one of the first steps. Based on James chapter 5, 14. Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what? I can pray over somebody as an elder with oil, but I can't pray over my home? Anointing your home is a modern way to declare your faith and seek God's protection. Just like the Israelites anointed their homes with blood, the destroyer passed over their home, we can anoint our home with oil pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over it. So how do we pray for each room? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. We should be praying as we're anointing the home. Lord, I anoint this wall right now in the name of Jesus Christ. No demon will be able to pass by in a hundred feet parameter. Lord, I bless it. I pray that this be a checkpoint for angels. Today's topic deals with anointing oil. And I had a listener that reached out and was interested in hearing about the take on this because of the teachings that are out there by some well-known people in the charismatic, hyper-charismatic streams. And uh, this is something I'm very familiar with as well. Um, I, when I was telling my husband that I was going to do this episode, he, re- he reminded me and I'd forgotten about it. Obviously, so I, there's things I want to forget, but 
but he said, are you going to talk about the uh, bottle of uh, olive oil that you anointed that you had at your workstation when you used to work? So I'm telling on myself right now, and I used to carry little vials of oil when I went to minister in places. So this uh, teaching and this belief is is something that is familiar to me, to say the least. Uh, we would even cut up pieces of cloth in the church I was in, um, uh, nice cloth napkins, and we would anoint them with oil and pray over them. And using the scripture uh, where it talks about that Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons that he worked in were sent out and that you would see demons cast out and you would see these healings take place. So there were things that I was very accustomed to and familiar with over the years and using this, even praying over doorways and such as you just heard in some of these shorts, such as from uh, Joanna Beck, uh, Jenny Weaver. You heard that from Rebecca Brown about commanding devils that they have to leave the premises and they can't even touch your pets when they leave. We heard Winita Bynum loading up a plastic water pistol with oil that she had from other people, family members and others that was highly anointed and was pure according to her. And so she put it in this water pistol while she was ministering and showing the people this and reminding them of the anointing that they can use against the devil. You'll even hear clips such as uh, from Bethel, if you saw the the very notorious clip of them praying with the Gandalf staff. And one thing you may not have noticed is when the lady up there that is exegeting about Gandalf, she talks about one of the apostles standing up there saying that you needed to anoint your door when dealing with the spirit of racism. Now, if you heard what Apostle Savosa said, he said that you need to oil your door. So I encourage you, if you haven't done this in the proper order, you must put oil in your door and then go in front and repeat this act with us that the spirit of racism may leave your house, whether you participated as a victim or as someone who did it. We all did it. For our country to be where it is right now, we all did it. And you heard the last clip I played, which you may not be familiar with this gentleman. His name is Richard Lorenzo Jr. We're actually going to be looking at the teaching that he did on this. This was a short that I played from his teaching on anointing your home. And like I said, this is not a new teaching. This has been around for a while in this type of movement. But I do want to look at what he said and to look at it in accordance with Scripture to see if the Scriptures that he's referencing actually tell us that this is what we are supposed to do. And we'll also talk about, um, is this something that scripture commands us to do or instructs us to do and should we do this should we not do this and what do we need to take into consideration and how do we look at scripture uh, on this matter so stay tuned we're going to take a look at this topic today hi there and welcome to the love six scribe podcast where we talk about biblical truths current topics and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word jesus christ i am don hill and i am the love six scribe in preparing to talk about this, I was looking at several different teachings on this that were shorter teachings. And one of the ones I came across was from Richard Lorenzo Jr. And he is also um, affiliated, it seems, with the Demon Slayers and others that run in these types of circles. And he's been on Sid Roth before and sharing his testimony. He espouses to be a former apostle of Satan. And now on his um, social media uh, channels, for example, on YouTube, just reading from the description, he calls himself an apostle now. So he's an, he's an apostle, Richard Lorenzo Jr. He's the founder of Remnant Revival Outreach Center, which is an end times army called to bring revival to the nations, resuscitating the body of Christ, reaching the lost in the highways and byways, moving in spirit and power. And he says that Remnant Revival Center is where people with different assignments callings and destinies come together in unity to glorify Jesus Christ in person and internationally through the digital spaces. Now, I don't know how long he's been a believer. I don't know when he became an alleged apostle. But at any rate, I'm going to talk about the teaching he did on this today. It's on a YouTube video that he did. It's about 19 minutes long. We're not going to look at all of it. I want to touch on some of the, the main points that he talked about anointing your home. The scripture talks about anointing oil, and we'll get there. But there are several scriptures that uh, Mr. Lorenzo brought up. And so I want to address those today and just go to the scripture as we always do. We are opening our Bibles and we're reading to see what scripture actually says in the context of which it's written. So that way we can better understand it. And And I want to just present some things that uh, just from someone who was in this and some perspective on it. So that way you can kind of see uh, where some people might be leaning towards or thinking when they do these things. And to also bring attention to 
even though some people say that the power is not in the oil, uh, but it's that it's in God, which I would agree with that statement. I would actually argue that what is stated is not what is practiced. So let's go ahead and listen to some of the clips of uh, Richard Lorenzo talking about this very subject. All right, let's go into anointing your home with oil. How many of you guys are excited for that teaching? How to anoint your home with oil. And I'm going to use Bible verses for anointing your home with oil. First thing I'm going to read is first, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these, these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Our homes, just like our bodies, can and should be sanctified. Why? Because demonic atmospheres are created in different areas. Our home needs to be an altar unto the Lord spiritually. Anointing our home with oil helps with that. I'm going to explain how to anoint your home with oil and the biblical backing for it. Look at this. The significance of oil. Exodus chapter 30 verses 24 through 25. And you shall make from these a holy anointing oil. This is the Bible. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If you're one of those people who don't want to believe the Old Testament is real, you're not reading the Bible all the way. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. I'm going to start and stop on this episode because he does talk and reference several different scriptures. Now, there is a section in here I'm going to skip over. It was several minutes long. It it, It does not even pertain to the anointing oil and anointing homes, but it had to do with the, the belief of continuation of gifts, and he kind of went off honestly in this rant on it. And I'm going to save that clip for another day uh, to to discuss that and some issues in that. So we'll we'll skip over that. But the very beginning, the first thing he mentions is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. So as always, we're going to use this as an exercise for us, right? Whenever someone mentions scripture, what is it that we're to do? We take out our Bibles and we begin to read and we want to see the context of it. Now, I know that some people are going to immediately say, well, you're being religious by reading um, or or pharisaical or legalistic. And I would just say, I I don't have a problem reading the scripture in context and neither should you. So uh, uh, firm, but loving on saying that. I just want to make that clear. Uh, As a believer in Christ, my foundation and my final authority is the word of God. It's not the word of God in what I feel that the passage says. It's not what, what I think it says. We can plainly read a lot of these texts and see what the context of it is. And also through good Bible study, we can understand what the historical context was, who the author was, who the audience was, how it applied to them, and how, if if it applies to us today, if it's a prescriptive passage. So I understand that there there will be people that hear this that will say, well, you're just religious and you're legalistic. Scripture is our final authority. And someone taking a scripture out of context and applying it in a way that it does not mean, that's not honoring God. So I think that we need to be more concerned about defending the word of God and defending the gospel and contending for the faith than, de- than defending an individual that we have held up as a sacred cow, essentially. And maybe that's going into that, that other episode that I want to talk about, because I think what's happened is, is that we're turning uh, people that we like into sacred cows and that they're hands off, that we can't touch them. And instead, we should be contending for the faith and the word of God in the proper context and, and ultimately glorifying Jesus. Jesus Christ. And that's my concern in this and coming out of false teaching. So let's get back to the topic at hand. (laughs) Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, he referenced it. So let's read it. It says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. I think it helps you, first of all, just as a suggestion when you're doing Bible study, if someone ever mentions a verse, as I've probably said uh, many times, you need to read what's before it. And then sometimes even what's after it to get an idea of what the context is. And I would just refer you to 2 Corinthians 6. Read that in your own time because Paul is talking about the temple, uh, which is our bodies, that we are to glorify God in our bodies, that uh, we are not to have agreement with with idols. He talks about idolatry in here, um, talks about lawlessness, the difference between righteousness and lawlessness, and that we're not to have fellowship with darkness. That's what he says prior to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. I would encourage you to read that in context and to see and ask the question, 
is this saying that we are to anoint our homes with oil? Because that is the what we're looking at today. That is the question. Are we ever instructed in Scripture to anoint the doorposts of our homes? Are we to anoint the windows? Are we to anoint our couch cushions? Are we to anoint our kids' toys? Are we to like slather our walls with oil? Are we to rebuke Satan? Are we to tell him not to touch our pets on the way out? Are, do we have to worry about demons being in our house as a born-again believer? Uh, what are, how are we to conduct ourselves? These are all things to consider when you're taking this into consideration. So there's the first one. But the other one I want to spend just a few minutes on was in the Old Testament. And I agree with Richard on this, that the Old Testament is valuable. He also goes on in the clip uh, about 30 seconds or more after what he just said to go on to say that the Old Testament is valuable because it has hidden gems in it, secrets, mysteries, and such. And I don't know what he means by that. I don't know if he has taken a Gnostic approach to that. Uh, I do know that the Old Testament has types and shadows in it that are pointing to Jesus Christ, who has already come. The New Testament reveals Christ, and he comes in the flesh as truly God and truly man. He fulfills the law and the words of the prophets. I agree with also with Richard saying that, because he acknowledged that, that he didn't come to abolish those, but he came to fulfill them. Where we disagree is, I don't know what he means by that the Old Testament has hidden gems and mysteries and secrets in it, because that can sound like, I don't know what his intention is, but that can sound like it's going into mysticism, Gnosticism, those types of areas that can be dangerous, um, that have actually, Gnosticism has been an enemy of the church since its, its inception. But Exodus chapter 30, he references verses 24 and 25, uh, and it talks about the description of the anointing oil, which, by the way, is noted in verse 25 as being sacred uh, and also holy. It, it mentions that twice in that very verse, that it will be sacred or holy and a holy anointing oil. It goes on in verse 26 to say, with it, you shall anoint the tent of the meeting and the ark of the testimony and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense sense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy whatever touches them will become holy you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests now I want to stop there for just a second because what Richard didn't read to, to his audience was verses 32 and 33 in Exodus 30. And this is something worth noting here uh, because people are being instructed, if, we're, if they're going to hold to Exodus 30, and this is my point, if you're going to tell people that if you disagree with this, you're just religious and, and pharisaical and you don't have the Holy Spirit because you don't want to anoint your home and, and you're going to disagree with this, then you have to be willing to read out the rest of the the text. Uh, you can't just pull a couple of verses and say, well, this is this tells us this is why we can do this. This was in the Old Testament. So this was, again, type and shadow. The, the oil is symbolic of the presence of God or the Holy Spirit. So this is showing also, too, not only the presence of God, but this is also showing that things were set apart, sanct sanctified, consecrated. Born-again believers, we are set apart. We are sanctified. We are consecrated unto the Lord, not in anything that we've done, but we are set apart by Christ himself because because of his finished work on the cross, his spirit comes to indwell us at the moment of salvation, and we are his. We belong to him. We have been bought at a price, and we are also to glorify God in every aspect of our lives, spirit, slash soul, and body. And that's a whole other topic, I know, for another day about the tripart versus that dichotomous being because of people holding different belief systems. And I've talked about that in other episodes. You're going to see here in just a minute, verse 32 and 33, if you're going to tell people <laughs> that this is why they need to make an anointing oil for their home, don't fail in, in telling them what verse 32 and 33 says, because in the Old Testament, this is what the people in Israel were told regarding this holy oil. Uh, verse 31, actually, it says, And you shall say to the people of Israel, This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. And, and so this is a good example if someone quotes a scripture, you need to read it on even after the verses, because you're not even seeing the full context when he says this. 
So this is something to be aware of. It's just a good exercise in general. It's not picking on Mr. Lorenzo. This is just a general exercise to help you, for those of you that have come out of this type of movement, or, it, or just in general, as a good Berean and a good student of the Word of God, who is fellowshipping with God through the the correct understanding of his word. Please read verses before and after when anyone, including myself, mentions verses. A lot of times I'll mention verses and where there can be discrepancies when someone says something and I'll reference other verses and tell you to go look at them because if I tried to to address every single verse, it, it would t- the podcast would take forever. And I want to respect your time and to encourage you, do Bible study on your own time. You are accountable for what you understand the word of God. And this is part of your fellowship with Christ. You cannot have um, a deeper relationship with God without knowing his word. We can't, and we can't just cherry pick the things out that we like about his word and then have some sort of Gnostical, mystical uh, explanation about them and say, well, there's something hidden in here and, and not rest on the sufficiency of his word in and of itself and understand the, even the proper context in that time period that, that didn't have a Gnostic meaning to it. That this was to show what they were instructed to do. And this is also at the same time, it has a typology to it alluding to the believer being the temple of the Holy Spirit and being set apart, being sanctified through the presence of God, through the Holy Spirit. So I I wanted to point that out um, because the Jewish people in that time were not permitted to make their own holy anointing oil that was set apart for the consecration of the Ten of Meeting, the Ark of the Covenant, and all of the utensils that were used in priestly service. Even the priests, I mean, this was specifically for that and doing this. Now, Am I telling you that you can't have anointing oil and that the anointing oil is unbiblical? Nope, I'm not telling you that. I'm simply saying, if someone's going to take this passage and to say, this is why you need to have anointing oil and make your own, they're not following out to for you uh, and doing a disservice, essentially, and not following out in what scripture actually says, and if they're going to refer to this verse. So let's keep going. I, like I said, I'm going to skip about it's actually six minutes worth, at least, of what he said about spiritual gifts and people that disagree and his his zealous feeling towards those that disagree. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. So I'm going to go about seven minutes in and where he picks back up talking about uh, he wants to correct the false doctrine of not anointing your home. I'm helping you right now brother or sister in Christ who's watching this real angry. I'm helping you. You know why? Because you're probably the same one who, who thinks that you can't anoint your home with oil. And it's, I'd rather help you out instead of you go start teaching false doctrines. So look at this. Praying over the oil is one of the first steps. You need to pray over the oil. So, based on James chapter 5 verse 14, listen. This is New Testament. Listen. Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what? I can pray over somebody as an elder with oil, but I can't pray over my home? Get out of here. There's a significance behind oil. Old Testament. Now this is the New Testament. Look at this. Now how to anoint your home. So you take extra virgin olive oil, right? If you got whatever oil you got is fine, okay? It's not about the substance. It's about the faith. Okay, I want to come back to this here in just a bit. But he references James chapter 5, verse 14, uh, 13 and 14. And uh, just to read this to you, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working uh, a couple of things here the context of this is is this talking about anointing your home no he actually will as you'll hear him in, a, in just a bit i'm going to go back into this and pick right back up where I, I stopped he's going to basically say you can anoint anything 
and ridiculing people that would actually question him because he it sounds like the perception is that he equates himself to Paul in here because Paul has the aprons and the 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 napkins that the handkerchiefs that people took that had been on Paul's body when he worked as a tent maker and they were using them a god was using them in a way to basically validate Paul's ministry as an apostle now i don't know if if richard believes that because he calls himself an apostle that that's why he can do this or if it's just a basic belief that spit that what he believes are spirit filled believers uh, what his definition of spirit filled believers are can do this i don't know again this is not something i don't i don't have a full uh, understanding from his end on what he believes but he does say this that you can he could anoint a water bottle and do the same thing and i just want you to again look at study this out do bible study on this but look at the what the context is james is saying for the sick which when you look this up some people um the, some of the commentaries I found, they'll actually make a note that the person is sick is very ill to the point where they cannot physically go. They are calling for the elders. The elders are the pastor elders that have been appointed the overseers of the church. It's not just for just it's not just for a speci- anybody to do this. The, the person that is severely ill and I'm, this is not a head cold or something like that and not to diminish someone that has a head cold, but this is talking about someone that, someone that is severely sick that they are ill it could be terminal illness things like that but someone is calling for the elders to come and pray because they are physically unable to go so they're calling for the elders to pray and the elders are anointing with them with oil in the name of the lord and then the focus is actually not on the oil but it's on the prayer because if you go on in verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And then it goes on to talk about if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Again, the elder is not forgiving that person. That would be wrong. The gospel affirms because Christ came and, and brought the gospel and proclaimed the gospel, and he is the gospel. And the disciples were to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they said to someone that their sins were forgiven, it was not them forgiving someone. It was them bringing the gospel to that person and saying, because you have acknowledged that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are forgiven. I am affirming because of your faith in Christ, in the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the atonement of our sins and to give us the promise of eternal life and to be adopted, justified, adopted, and to be and to be sanctified and glorified is because your faith has been placed in Christ that we can say and affirm you are forgiven. You can't forgive someone's sins on behalf of God. Again, that's acting as a mediator. And then at the opposite end, someone who rejects Christ, then you can say because you've rejected the gospel and you've rejected Christ, you are condemned. That's what that verse is meaning. There's a verse in the Gospels where Jesus tells them this, that when you forgive someone's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're condemned. Again, study that in Bible study. You'll find that that is the meaning that that is pointing towards. It's not you acting as a mediator. So the elders are coming here because they've been appointed by God to be the leaders in that church, the elders, pastors slash elders, and that they are coming and anointing that sick person that is a member of the, the church and praying for them. So the focus is not even on the oil. The focus is on the prayer. And it, the, even then, the focus is on the God to whom we are praying. <laughs> so do you see? And, and the thing is, is that I've heard people say, and, and we used to say this, we don't, you know, we're not focusing on the oil. Well, if that's not the case, then why are you, un- he's going to say something here in a minute, and he's basically saying that anoint- it doesn't matter what type of oil it is, uh, anointed, uh, anointing oil is anointed because of the, the anointed person praying over that. Why do you need to pray over that oil? You know what I'm, sa- you see what I'm saying here? It's almost as if that the focus is on the oil. The focus is on you doing something. The focus is on an object rather than the object of your faith being God. And rather than following a biblical uh, protocol, which James 5 13 and 14 is a biblical protocol. If someone is severely sick or terminally ill and they're a, a, a born again believer and they're part of the local, they have a local church body, then they're, they can call for the elders to pray for them. And it is biblical for the elders to pray and ask God, God, heal this person. And at the same time, that this person would be 
forgiven of their sins, that they are acknowledging their faith in Christ. Again, I just want to to draw attention to this. This is not saying anything about anointing your home and, and telling you to do this, but it's being read into the text by people to do that. It's something that we need to be aware of. And then when people make this a doctrine and then they're telling you, well, I'm just trying to correct you so you don't have false doctrine. Just because I don't anoint my home, which, by the way, that was something I used to do and decree and declare over things and anoint stuff even in my workplace and things like that. Just because I no longer do those things doesn't mean that I don't have faith and it doesn't mean that I have false doctrine. Uh, We need to stop that. (laughs) I'm going to use a Bob Newhart uh, uh, saying and say, stop that. Because you're putting bondages on people by telling them that they have to do these things. Otherwise, they're not spirit filled and they're not born again. And if they question you, then there's something wrong with them and they don't have the Holy Spirit. And that's shaming people for no good reason whatsoever. So let me keep going with what uh, Richard has to say. I'm going to get deep. You could even take water if you wanted to. Oh, people are going to call me a false prophet. They're going to call me a false prophet. Oh, uh, he's talking about Catholic holy water. No, I'm not. I'm talking about anything you do in faith in the name of Jesus Christ. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. People get so religious with this stuff, man. Oh, it must be extra virgin olive oil all the way from Israel. Just because because you're buying Israel, you're buying oil online from Israel doesn't make it more anointed, my brother and my sister. Anointed oil is not anointed unless someone who's anointed prays over it. Catch that. I'm going to say it again. Oil is not anointed. Unless someone who's anointed prays over it. So just because you go get oil, extra virgin olive oil straight from the from the olive trees of Israel doesn't mean you can go over there and pray over your house and you're gonna it's gonna be protected. No, it's the prayer of somebody anointed. And who's anointed, my brother and sister? You are with the anointed one, Christ, who lives inside of you when you receive the Holy Ghost. Okay, so if I'm anointed, which I know the first John 2, 20 and 27 talks about this, and I'll mention that again near the end. But yes, born again believers are, we have the anointing. All of us do. There is no hierarchy in the body of Christ. We're all even keel, as I've, I've already said, as far as the anointing, that, that we have the anointing occurred in first John 2, 20 and 27. So why do I need to physically anoint my home with oil, if that's the case? And why am I driving, why am I told to drive out demons out of my home if God has anointed me? Again, it's a type and shadow in the Old Testament with the fulfillment in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit has come. He's not continuing to come. He is already here. He is here. And He is indwelling the people of God who are placing their faith and hope in Him and they believe on Him as their Lord and Savior. He indwells them. He brings them to spiritual life. He's conforming them to the image of Christ. There are so many things, as I've talked about, that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a born-again believer. There's, there are many things that He does, that He regenerates us, that He convicts us of sin. He empowers us with gifts. He testifies in our hearts that we are God's children. He leads us. He makes us fruitful. He grants and nurtures in us resurrection life. He enables us to kill sin. He intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. He guides us into all truth. He transforms us into the image of Christ. He testifies of Christ, not of himself. These, there are many scriptures that we can go to to understand that in the proper context, right? So when someone is telling you, again, you want to anoint your home, that's fine. But just understand that uh, this is not a biblical instruction. So, spoiler alert for the end. This is not a biblical instruction, that you're not told to it to anoint your home or to anoint your desk at work or your the classroom or you're not told to anoint your dog and and you're not told to anoint and again this is someone and I I know people that may listen to this are going to get upset with me in saying that but this is coming from someone that used to do this so I understand <laughs> that when we start touching again some areas where it feels like this is something that we that we're passionate about doing that it can it can really raise hackles on this but you need to see is this is this instructed in scripture no is it not instructed in scripture no at the same time, taking both of those things into consideration there are no instructions forbidding it there are no instructions instructing it. So this is not some sort of burden that you need to put on people that they must do this. Otherwise, they're going to have demons in their home. Then the burden of proof is on that person who's teaching that doctrine to provide that in scripture. 
that is their burden of proof to do that. Just like I've said, the burden of proof is on the deliverance ministers to to show where a born again, spirit filled believer had demons physically cast out of them. So this is the point of that is that this is not instructed in scripture. It's not forbidden in scripture and taking that into consideration and we'll get there. We'll, t- we'll talk a little bit about this. And, and I would encourage you, if, when you try to look this up online, all you find is people that, that encourage to do this, including Kenneth Copeland and other people. There's articles on Kenneth Copeland's website that talk about this and, and the things that you're supposed to do. For example, that uh, when, when you anoint your home, you're supposed to remove anything with evil roots from your home. Well, how do you know what that is? He, they said this can be books, movies, clothing with certain pictures or symbols or objects that have a connection to wrong spirits. And this this, this very much sounds like almost a, like a paganism type stuff that you're telling people, well, you need to be in superstitious, that you need to be concerned if you have some sort of image in your home that you could be inviting demons. There's nothing in scripture that tells you that. You're told to pray aloud in every room on Copeland's website. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill every inch of your home. Uh, pray that only his will be done and that everything that is said and done in your home will be pleasing to him. I would actually agree. We want our our homes, aka our families, to glorify God in all that they do. We want our homes to be a place where God is glorified, right? Not just our physical dwellings, but our family, our, our, the, the mother, father, and the children, we want our family, our home, to glorify God, both within our family unit and when people come to fellowship in our home. So that's a biblical approach to do that, right? Uh, but they're using it in such a way, again, this is more, looks more paganistic a lot of times when you're telling people, oh, put oil on the walls and he's going to, Richard's going to talk about that. But it, uh, C- Copeland says on his website, rebuke the power of darkness and any attempt of the enemy against your home or family. I would just point you, I think I've talked about this before. We're not supposed to be binding Satan. There's nothing in scripture that tells us to bind Satan, uh, to put demons into the abyss. We don't have that authority. Uh, we're told as believers how we're to conduct our when it comes to biblical spiritual warfare. We resist the devil, James 4, 7, because we're submitted to God, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We're told in Ephesians 6 to put on the armor of God, which is symbolic of putting on Christ. When you look at the different elements of it, and we are to stand firm, we are to pray. We are to recognize that Satan is a defeated foe. So again, Satan is made much of in this movement. The gospel is made little of. <laughs> and and I'm sorry to say that, but it's the truth. When you hear a lot of this stuff being taught, the gospel is is sparse in, in this movement, but much is made of the demonic and, and teaching on the demonic and all these other spirits and this and that. I'm bleeding over into other <laughs> topics, so excuse me for that. C- Copeland goes on to say, plead the blood of Jesus over each room in your family. There is great power in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, there is great power in in the blood of the lamb to cleanse us from unrighteousness. We're never told in scripture. And again, coming from someone, I can raise both hands and both feet in the air that I was one of those that used to plead the blood of Jesus. It's not necessary. It's, it's not in scripture for us to do that. We're not instructed to do that. And then we're to place the oil on the frame of every door in our home to do this by faith, believing and receiving God's supernatural protection over the home and family. And he references Isaiah 10, 27, which is the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. I remember hearing that verse quite often in this movement. And I can also tell you that there's other translations that don't say that wording. He's referencing New King James. This is Copeland's website, not, not Lorenzo. Uh, This is referencing New King James Version. I mean, you'll see even the ESV, it says the yoke will be destroyed because of the fat. Or there's other uh, verses that say because of the fatness, and it's talking about the sacrifice that's given. So again, do your study on Isaiah 10, 27 in the context. Uh, But these things are referenced because of the anointing, and the focus is on the anointing. And if the focus is not on the oil, then why is the oil made such a big deal out of? It would be good to get this certain type of oil. Lorenzo saying you don't need to get this certain type of oil. It's it's about the person that prays over the oil. There's nothing in Scripture that says in the New Testament that people are praying over the oil so that the oil will be effective. It's about the prayer in general of a of a righteous man, of a the the fervent prayer of a righteous man it has great power as it is working because ultimately the power is in the God to whom we are praying. It is not in us. 
And again, the focus then becomes on us and how we're doing and what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go in our home, like some of these people are saying, and we're supposed to anoint everything. We're just supposed to just just grease it on up, buddy, and just pour the oil everywhere, and then the demons can't get in. Well, I have a question. <laughs> I have a question, and there's a couple more clips I'll play, and then we'll, we'll close out for the day. I have this question I want to ask. If you're saying that you can slather up your walls and that you can pray and rebuke demons and they can't even come a hundred feet from around your home, as you heard in that short clip at the beginning with Lorenzo saying that, then why don't you just stay in your house and then you won't have to worry about having demons cast out of you? Now, that's a very impractical and um, unreasonable thing to tell somebody, but I want you to think about that. If you believe that you have that power and that the oil has that power, that you can oil your door, referencing Exodus 12, which I'll play that in a minute, that has nothing to do at all. It says nothing about oil there, but people will use that to basically say, well, you can anoint your home and that you must anoint your home in order to keep the demonic out. Okay, well, where's the scripture that says that? Because it's not in it's not in the Bible for that we're commanded to do that or that we need to do that. But if you're telling people that they have to do this and they can keep demons at bay and keep them away from their home, well, then just tell people to stay in their homes if there's that much power. And then they don't have to worry about coming to your deliverance meetings. So anyway, we'll keep going with uh, the clips from R- Richard Lorenzo. Let's see what else he has to say on this matter. And it gets deeper. That's why the Bible says go to an elder because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. So you, believer, if you're a new believer, if you're not an elder, you know what you should do? Take oil and get an elder to pray over it because their prayer is powerful. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. This is the Bible. This is how you are able to discern by the Spirit how to use Scripture. Bro, you can use any type of oil. You can use peanut oil. It don't matter, man. I personally, the oil we have at our, at our, at our house, in the church house, we, I, we took oil and we used different things like frankincense, myrrh, di- uh, different, different fragrances that, that they used in the Old Testament, and we put it together in a syringe, and I took it to the mountains of Moravian Falls where there's the second most angelic activity after the Mountain of Olives in Jerusalem, and I prayed over it on a fast, on a consecration for about almost a week, and this was a, a few months ago. Okay, I'm going to try to hold it together here because I have a clip to play. He mentioned Moravian Falls. I, I'm going to, again, I'm going to play some more here in just a moment of what he said. And, uh, I, but I wanted to stop here and interject because if you're not familiar with Moravian Falls, this is where Rick Joyner's ministry is located. And also, um, there is um, a retreat there that's on top of this mountain. And so I, I found this clip from uh, Jennifer LeClaire that went a few years ago, and she's talking about that there is a vortex, an angelic vortex there. So I don't know if this is what he's talking about, but I thought I'd just play this for you, just just in case you may not be familiar with what goes on at Moravian Falls, what, what they believe happens there. Hey guys, I'm here at Moravian Falls. I'm at Prayer Mountain. This is one of the many places we're going to explore in this encounters retreat. I mean, I'm so excited just to be here. I've heard about this for so many years. It's true what they say. There's a vortex here, as Paul Cain said. There's open portals. There's open heavens. There's angelic activity. If you want to encounter God, I want you to be here with me. I'm going to teach you, equip you, impart to you, activate you. But you're going to have something that you really, really need, and that's alone time. You're going to have time to seek the Lord. And so we're balancing this out really well with the, the teaching, the fellowship. You know, we want to hear your stories and what you're experiencing. You need a touch from God. I need a touch from God. That's why I'm here. I've come several times now to be here in this atmosphere to hear from the Lord. There is truly an open heaven here. I want you to be part of the special, special retreat. I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. Join me. I can't wait for this. This has been years and years and years in the making, and I can't wait to hear what you hear and what you see when you come here with us. So according to Jennifer and others, there are portals and vortexes that are open there. It's an open heaven. And that uh, this is one of the places that you can go and experience God and encounter God. And I just want to encourage those that may ask, 
Oh, I, what if I never get to go there? Listen, you don't need to go to a specific place to know God. And you don't need to seek some sort of encounter uh, to hear the voice of God or anything else. You can go to His Word and to, and to understand Him better. And hearing the gospel ministered to you, uh, prayer for, for born-again believers, we pray, we worship, we fellowship with other believers. We gather together uh, to, to lift up His name and to be reminded of our need for Him and to grow in our understanding of the Word of God and that we may minister to our families and minister to others we come in contact with. We're to preach the gospel and to make disciples. You don't need to go to a physical location like that with someone claiming that there's open heavens there, that there's portals, which sounds new age, by the way, and a vortex and all of these other things and make it sound like it's it's something that you can't do without wanting someone to to desire to do that and that you have to go to a physical place to experience God. And along with that, the, the anointing oil of thinking that you could get special anointing oil. He just said you didn't have to get it from Israel, but then he makes it sound as if taking it to the Moravian Falls. He, he negates what he even just said, what Lorenzo said. He's like, well, you don't need extra virgin olive oil from Israel. That doesn't make it more anointed. But then he backpedals on what he said, not realizing it and saying, well, he spent and focusing on what he did. So he spent all this time for a week in prayer and fasting and consecrating that oil at Moravian Falls because there was angelic activity there so apparently the location of where you get the oil doesn't matter but where you pray for it does i guess it just it seems double-minded to me i don't know maybe i'm missing something um because i i know that i miss a lot but and i do but and and i miss a lot for 18 years so at any rate i I wanted to play at least one maybe two more clips Uh, about 11 minutes in he starts talking about exodus 12 so let's hear that and we'll take a look at that for just a moment exodus chapter 12 verse 22 and you shall take a bunch of hyssop dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out the door of his house until morning for the lord will pass through to strike the egyptians and when he sees the blood of the lintel and on the two doorposts the lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer the destroyer the destroyer to come into your house to strike you so anointing your home is a modern way to declare your faith and seek God's protection. Just like the Israelites anointed their homes with blood so that the the destroyer passed over their home, we can anoint our home with oil, praying, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over it, praying in tongues, getting an elder to pray over it for, 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 for protection, for healing, for deliverance. You could take that oil and you could anoint anything. You could anoint your work desk at work. Let's get deep. You can go to your job and shift the atmosphere of your area, praying over oil and bringing it and anointing your home. You could anoint your car. You could anoint your closet. You could anoint your children. You could anoint your family. I see people that anoint their instruments before they worship, worshipers. I've seen people who are videographers that anoint their cameras for, for protection. They'll anoint their cameras for protection. Bro, you could anoint anything onto the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. So, so you, you heard him say that you could anoint different things. And again, he made a reference about now the power is not in the oil, but the it's in the power of the person praying. Well, you know, again, I go back to 1 John 2, 20 and 27. Those of us who are in Christ, we are anointed by Christ. We, we have the anointing uh, because of the Spirit of God that dwells within us. And so why is there any need for us to use oil? If you don't believe that the oil is where the power is, then why are you using it? As, as this teaching uh, for doing this. And again, I just, I point that out because as someone who is in this, I mean, much was made about the oil. In fact, I can recall even, I did a lot of study on Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, sad to say, he was one of my heroes when I was in this movement. I actually did my, quote, doctorate, my thesis on, it's not even a real thesis. It was a it was like a, a 80 some page paper that I wrote on Smith Wigglesworth using uh, references, now realizing using references that were biased towards him that were all 
all in support and favor of him and telling of his great exploits and things and a lot of accounts that I, that I don't believe can be verified. But I remember hearing about Smith Wigglesworth, one of the things that people loved about him, too, was that he carried his own vial of oil around when he wanted to anoint people. And so that was one thing I wanted to do, and, and that was why I carried a bottle of oil with me, was that I wanted to be like him in that capacity of having anointing oil. Where is the focus? The focus is not on Christ. The focus was on Wigglesworth in that example, and the focus was on the oil. So the object of faith was on another man or woman of God in what they had done. And this is a misplacement. This is dis- this is a displaced view of faith. Again, look back at James 5. The focus is not on the oil. The oil is symbolic of setting that person apart and asking God in prayer through an elder who has been appointed by God to be a leader in the church to pray for that person and to ask God to intervene in that situation. And looking at 1 John 2, verse 27, for example, uh, John said, But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. So the anointing comes from God. It comes from the Spirit of God that dwells within us as born-again believers. At anywhere that we go, in order to proclaim His gospel and to testify of Him, then why does it matter that we anoint instruments and anoint cameras and anoint our desks and do all of these things that, again, seem seem to give the perception of, of being more pagan than anything? I mean, there are people in other belief systems that will use anointing oil for different reasons. We must come back to what Scripture has to say and stay within the confines of Scripture so that we don't go outside those boundaries. People keep talking about, well, don't put God in a box. Well, God created boundaries. You can call it a box if you want to, but God created boundaries, and He created boundaries for His people for a reason. And it was for protection and to mark them as His own people. And to not do what everybody else is doing or what other people are doing and then bring, bring confusion to that. Or to say, well, we don't put our emphasis on the oil, but you need to do this. And also, by the way, one, one glaring thing that I'm missing here, Exodus 12 says nothing about anointing your door with oil. Exodus 12 had to do with the Passover, A feast that Jesus fulfilled, by the way. And this is, again, a type and shadow. The blood was put over the doorposts so that the destroyer could not come in. And we know that Jesus, the Passover lamb, he has fulfilled this. And guess what? It talks about this in the New Testament, that he has overcome Satan and overcome the power of death that Satan held. We need to be correlating this and stay in the Word and see. The Old Testament, how can we see this in the New Testament? Because we need both. We we must have the Old Testament and the New Testament. You're not going to understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. There's so many things in the Old Testament that are pointing to Christ, and there's so many prophecies that were fulfilled, and there's so much of the Old Testament within the New Testament that is referenced. So the Old Testament... Not to mention that in the beginning of the inception of the church, what did they use to preach the gospel? They used the Old Testament. <laughs> the, Old, the New Testament was not yet written. So, we, But we know this is all scripture. This is from God. It's God breathed. Using Exodus 12 as a proof text to say, well, since they put blood over their doorposts, then I can put oil over mine and I can just lather up my, my musical instruments and everything else that I put my hands on and the anointing has to be there. Where is your focus again? You said it wasn't on the oil, but yet it is the oil that you're putting the focus on. Whereas as a born again believer, we have the anointing. So wherever we are, whether it were work, we're standing in line at the bank, whether we're at the grocery store, we are to be ready to proclaim the gospel. We are ready, we're to be ready to speak on behalf of God in that capacity. If you want to say people that are prophetic, then be prophetic and proclaim the gospel because people do not come to saving faith in Christ unless they hear and they have to hear the gospel. Exodus 12 doesn't have to do with you anointing your door. That We cannot say that you must use that passage in order to validate and say, well, this is why you anoint. Now, real quickly, let's see what he had to say just for a moment about how you're supposed to pray throughout rooms, and then we're going to end with some closing thoughts. So how do we pray for each room? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 
Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we must be ongoing in prayer and not just not just the, during the prayer of anointing of our home. So we need to pray in our homes, and when we anoint our homes, after, the, after it's prayed over, we should be praying as we're anointing the home. So when you get the oil... You pray over it, or you have an elder pray over it, or a congregation pray over it, or a prophet pray over it, or a pastor, whoever it is. When you have somebody pray over it and you feel comfortable, like, okay, I'm ready, you are to go around your house and start anointing different areas and praying as you're going. So if you pray in the Holy Ghost, Lord, I anoint this wall right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I like to put a cross that symbolizes the cross of Christ. I put a cross. I anoint this, this, this wall in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Protection. No demon will be able to pass by in a hundred feet parameter. Lord, I bless it. I pray that this be a checkpoint for angels. I pray the atmosphere here will be holy. I pray it will be clear of any demonic interference in Jesus' name. And I keep moving with my oil in my hand. And I keep moving. Now I go over to the kitchen. Now I'm praying over the kitchen. Lord, anyone that steps in this kitchen, let them encounter your presence, Father. Let an angel stand guard in this kitchen. Hey, I start praying in the Holy Ghost with fire. Let an angel stand guard. Thank you, Father. I start thanking the Lord. Thank you, Father, that an angel will be posted here in Jesus' name. You know, prayer is a is a vital aspect of the life of a believer. And prayer doesn't have to be hyped up, and it doesn't have to be sensationalized. And it, it can be quiet. It doesn't have to uh, be necessarily emotive, though it can be sometimes. But I do believe, and I would agree that as far as prayer being central, again, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us we are to anoint our homes with oil. We need to go back to what the Word says about how we are to conduct ourselves in spiritual warfare, biblically speaking, and we cannot commission angels or dispatch them. So the angels are under the command of the Lord, just as a reminder of that, whether that's what He meant by that or not when He said that. I'm just wanting to, to make that clear on my end. We we cannot commission angels or dispatch them or command them to do things. They are the Lord's angels. I believe that it would be biblical to ask God to uh, protect our homes, to ask Him. We cannot demand that or decree that or declare that. And if we want uh, the presence of God to, uh, for example, if someone were to come in your kitchen and you're saying, uh, let them encounter you, Jesus. Well, as believers, we are anointed by God, by His Spirit, to where when we are in the presence of someone else, that we have the good news that we are to share with other people. We are to share the gospel. We are to share what the word of God says. We are to, we are to love other people um, in, a, in a way that would glorify Christ and testify of him and, uh, in, in word and deed. And so, again, there can be a focus on experiential things in this type of movement. And with an experience or, you know, we, we just pray that, that someone would encounter Jesus. What does that mean, encounter Jesus? Can you be more specific about that when you say that? And how are they going to? encounter him. If they don't hear the gospel, then I don't know what Jesus they've encountered because they come through, again, through faith in Christ, through, uh, yes, there can be an experience in that because they're not robots, but at the same time, their faith is not in that experience. Their faith is in Christ. Their faith is in the gospel of which they've heard that, that they need salvation. Those are just some of the things in the video. I didn't play the whole thing all, all the way through, of course, but I wanted to touch on some of those things and to offer some things for consideration, for thought. Now, as we're getting ready to part ways today. I did want to touch on this. This is on gotquestions.org. And just so you're aware, there's 20 times in the Bible that the anointing oil is mentioned. Uh, it's mentioned in the Old Testament, as we know, in Exodus 25, verse 6, in Leviticus 8, verse 30, and in Numbers chapter 4, verse 16. It is called holy three times. And this is where, uh, when we read in Exodus 30, that the Jews were forbidden to make it for personal use. There is no indication of supernatural powers. And that was one of the things they noted in their article, and I've read that in other places. There was no indication of supernatural powers within the oil itself. And so that that is something I want to drive home, and I've mentioned that several times. And you'll hear people in this movement that they'll say, well, we don't believe the powers in the oil, but they'll put a lot of emphasis on the oil and what you put in it and who prays for it and these other things. So the attention is, is drawn back to the oil or to the individual with the oil rather than understanding biblically 
biblically, we are anointed by God through his spirit. We don't have any need for this. And then when there is a biblical precedent for oil, such as in James 5, there's instructions in there that that is a biblical practice to carry out. And what is significant about that? Again, not the oil, because the oil is symbolic of separating that person, but the prayer to God on behalf of that person and and what that does um, that is this that is the the focus we see in Matthew chapter 6, verse 17, Jesus talks about anointing your head and washing your face. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 13, about the anoint that they anointed people for healing, the disciples did. I'm just giving you some of the references. And then that way, if you want to in your own time, that you can do Bible studies on these. Again, we've already referenced James chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, uh, the, the elders anointing the sick for healing. So to sum this up and to state this once again, there's nothing in scripture that instructs us to use Uh, anointing oil like this or in other instances, and there's nothing in there that forbids us to use it uh, in such a way. But the question comes, are people putting power in the oil or in the act itself? And that's the question. And I would say yes to both, that there is um, an emphasis on the oil and there's an emphasis on the person that's doing it, making sure that they're anointed. Apparently, there's an emphasis on where you're getting the oil, depending on who you talk to and what's taking place that apparently there's power being infused into that oil. And that that would seem to cross into boundaries of new age and occultic type could uh, cross into boundaries such as new age and occultic and other things, paganistic type views that we really need to be cautious of doing those things. Now, you may be asking, you know, would it, would it be okay for me to, to bless my home? There's nothing in scripture that tells us not to do that or to do that. But we need to go back to uh, understanding that the the presence of God dwells within us and that we carry his presence uh, with us, that he that He abides in us, he dwells within us. And that while he's sanctifying us and conforming us to the image of Christ, because of the anointing that God has given us, we are anointed to know what the word of God says. We are anointed to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. And we are anointed to speak uh, the truth of what God's word says and to testify of him. And so there's no need for us to carry little vials of oil with us and even use it as a vehicle, if you will, for the anointing of God, for the presence of God. You are there right in front of that person. You are not God. He has anointed you with his presence, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he abides within you and he want and he wants his word to abide within you so that that way you are always ready as as uh, Peter talks about always ready to give a reason for the hope that you have that you're ready to give a defense for the reason for the hope that you have you we are to proclaim the gospel and we cannot do that apart from the spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God testifies of the gospel. I, I just wanted to to point that out, that though we're not instructed in Scripture to anoint our homes and things like that, I would urge you to go back to the Word of God. I would urge you to um, to seek what, what the Bible says about that and have an understanding of the anointing as far as the believer for us today, the born-again believer, in contrast to the Old Testament to see the types and shadows that are in there. So I hope that this was helpful today. Um, and, and just look at this type of teaching, and again, we're looking at the teaching. We're not looking at attacking an individual, or I know that that can be difficult sometimes when people listen, and especially if they have someone they like on a personal level and they like listening to them, but we need to put the personal preferences aside, and we need to listen to what's being taught, because ultimately, if someone is not leading you in the right direction, or there's mean-spiritedness going on, and there's division being made uh, among things that people are being told that they're not believers because they don't do A, B, C, D, and E, and they even question it, then we need to be willing to look at those things and to make sure that what we're being taught is lining up with the Word of God, because ultimately we want to glorify Christ in what we're doing. We don't want to elevate a man or woman. We don't want to elevate ourselves. We want to exalt Christ in every aspect of our lives. And I would argue that you don't need to anoint your home. That's not something that's mandatory for you to do. When you're serving your family, conducting yourself as a believer in Christ, as we should, 
especially as women, when, if we're married, we have children, when we're conducting ourselves in such a way that we're godly wives and we're godly mothers, granted, we're not perfect. We are going to fall and miss the mark on a day-to-day basis, uh, but praise the Lord for His Spirit that is progressively sanctifying us day by day. We must realize that we don't need certain gimmicks or to do certain things in order to feel empowered. We've already been empowered by the, the Spirit of God, and He empowers us to be conformed to the image of Christ. He empowers us to know the truth of His Word, to stay in His Word, and to uh, be regenerated and to walk in the ways and lead us into, and guide us into all truth. And that's sufficient for us. So again, I hope you found this episode helpful, and I look forward to being on here with you again as we cover another topic. Until next time, be blessed today by the truth of God's Word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesixscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.